Come with me today as I explore ancient ruins in the backcountry of Arizona, searching for red ochre which may have been used to decorate the polychrome pottery that was made here over 700 years ago. So about that red slip that they used on Salado Polychrome, Patricia Crown in her epic study of Salado Polychrome, in which she almost completely ignores the white clay, does talk about the red slip a little bit. And what she found was that across a large area of where this Salado Polychrome was manufactured and across a large period of time during which it was manufactured, the color on many of these Salado Polychromes of the red is the same, this what she calls raspberry red. So this kind of implies that this red slip they were using was coming from one source and being carried on trade routes. Just like we've discovered, the Salada white slip was being carried on trade routes and coming from probably one or a couple of sources as well. The other interesting thing about the red slip is Mary Ownby, who's a ceramics analyst for Desert Archaeology, has said that the red is not clay and it doesn't have any clay added to it. It's just pure red mineral. So that to me tells me that chances are it's a hematite, iron oxide, but not just any hematite, probably an earthy hematite or what's often called red ochre. And the reason I think that is that it's already in fine particle size, so it's easy to deal with, but it also has clay-like properties. What I think I'm looking for is a raspberry red colored red ochre. This isn't just some little spot where you know, you find ochre here and there. There had to have been a lot of it for them to be using the same ochre for so much time over such a large area. There's a loaf of processed red hematite at the Beshbagawa Museum, which I always thought was fascinating. And it's like they've taken this hematite that they've mined somewhere and they processed it into a loaf that then they could use to transport. This is probably how this hematite was traded around the Southern Southwest was in these loaves. And if you look at this one at Beshbagawa, you can see little bits of yellow in it. And that always gave me a clue about the source. Wherever this raspberry red ochre is, it's got yellow with it. And they were trying to avoid the yellow, but they, they accidentally got bits of it in there. Today I'm hiking into a cliff dwelling that I think might be the spot. So come with me, see what we can find. There's really a couple of different kinds of ruins we find in the ancient Southwest. There's habitation sites, place where people lived most of the time or all of the time, permanent homes, which like our homes today, were close to work. So being an agricultural people, uh, these permanent habitation sites are usually fairly close to uh, agricultural lands, fields where they can cultivate corn and beans and such. Then there's, uh, you know, field houses, for example, uh, little places they might inhabit once in a while. So if there's a field that's several miles from your village that you want to cultivate, but you have to stay there and work for a week or two at a time while you cultivate the field or plant it or whatever, then you might build what's called a field house. You might build a single room house over there near that field. Uh, and the same goes for like uh, sometimes along trade routes, you'll find little um, shelters built where people were traveling and they could stay the night temporary sorts of homes. And then there's uh, defensive homes, places where I'm going to live because the man is after me uh, and I don't want them to uh, steal my wife, uh, make my children into slaves, these kind of things. So these are often way up in the mountains, built in cliffs. So for example, uh, Tonto Cliff Dwellings uh, is definitely a, a defensive site. Uh, it's not near any field. It's a long way from an agricultural field, uh, but it'd be very hard to get up there and attack somebody or take wives and children or that sort of thing. A lot of the cliff dwellings here in the Sierra Anches are defensive sites. Uh, they're, they're way up in the mountains or up on the side of a cliff, very hard to reach. Uh, they're a long way from agricultural fields. This is way too low uh, to be a defensive site. It's not defensible. It's, it's barely up above the canyon bottom. It's nowhere near agricultural land. It's very rocky up here. You couldn't cultivate corn within five miles of this spot, probably. Uh, this is probably 
uh, one of those temporary structures where miners would stay when they were up here mining. And this is only a short, this is a day's walk from Schoolhouse Point Platform Mound, which is one of those big, massive villages during Salado times uh, that was producing a lot of Salado polychromes. This was probably part of that establishment. This was that mining portion where they were mining the ochre that then was traded out to other areas and may have been uh, along or very close to those trade routes that came down from the Colorado Plateau, bringing that white clay and whatever else they were bringing from the Colorado Plateau down to these low deserts. And so uh, this was just another commodity that was being mined and probably these homes were built here uh, you know, for miners to stay. And it's really right in a layer where there's a lot of that very soft ochre. So it's, um, if you stayed here, you'd be really close to where you were working. So it makes a lot of sense. Of course, I'm not collecting hematite from the ruins. I'm collecting it down canyon from the ruins, someplace across the way nearby, but it's the same formation. So I'm gonna get the same results or it's similar. I'm here at the Schoolhouse Point Platform Mound. This is where the elites would have lived who were controlling the slip trade and therefore the production of that Salado polychrome pottery. So. Most of that, or a large part of that ochre coming out of that area, probably would have come back here and then been traded out from here to other places. One thing I noticed about that red ochre there is that the really good stuff, the really fine and bright red material, is in really thin layers between layers of that grittier material. So if you just look at it, it looks really bright and colorful, but a lot of that is really gritty. So it's not the best material to use for making pottery. So if you wanted to bring back a bunch of the really good material, uh, it would take some time to, uh, you know, to get all the good material. So you have to kind of break off layers of that shale and then get down underneath there and kind of scrape up the really fine bright red material. Uh, and it takes some hunting to find those layers too. So if you look out here, that gap in the mountains right there, that pass right there, is where you would go from here to get to that ochre and then once you cross that pass it'd be maybe maybe another six seven miles beyond that so you might ask yourself uh how did they how did they transport it so this is my burden basket uh, that my friend wind made for me last year um, we traded some pottery for it so um this is similar to what they would have had something about this size i don't know if you would work at filling a basket this size up with ochre or that might be too much weight so maybe you could only do half a basket I'm just not sure uh, but it'd be fun to experiment with the reason I got this basket I was hoping to do some experiments with actually uh, transporting goods clay or or um, pigments like hematite uh, just to see how it was and how much they could have carried um, so this is how it goes I know this is just a rudimentary strap um, uh, if you go to the Arizona State Museum, they have some really elaborate uh, tump straps like this uh, that are woven, have some really elaborate designs uh, painted or, or embroidered into them. But, um, you know, I'm not a sewer, so it's just a rope and, you know, maybe I could get some padding there, uh, but it's just to demonstrate how it worked. Uh, so you'd have the, the pack like this, you'd carry the weight on your forehead um, you know, and then you saw the distance, so I don't know, maybe uh, 15 miles, something like that, over there to the, to the source. So that's how they would have transported the goods, uh, and then they'd have probably made those little um, loaves, like I showed you from Beshbagawa Museum, and then you could trade them out that way. Okay, so I'm gonna head back to my studio and see if we can try processing some of that ochre I collected.
So I only got one Ziploc bag worth of material yesterday. And the reason for that is I was on a tight timeline. I was trying to beat the heat. So uh, I was very expedient with the filming that I was doing down there. I just didn't have a whole lot of time for collecting. And that's fine. The amount I got is great for running some tests and experimenting with it, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, if I want to use it, I want to go back. So uh, how am I going to clean this up? I've got a lot of little bits of shale in here. Um, you know that aren't gonna make paint so I'm just gonna by hand I'm just gonna rinse off these bits of shale because they were all covered with ochre when I pulled them out I, So I don't want to lose any of that ochre if I can help it But um, this stuff is just gonna be grit in my paint obviously so I don't want that So I'm just rinsing it off a little bit making sure there's no ochre stuck on it And I'm just gonna pull them out by hand carefully and then when I'm done with that I'm gonna levigate this that means I'm gonna stir it up I'm going to let the larger particles settle, which, because this isn't clay, uh, the larger particles will settle very fast. Uh, even, even the pieces I'm trying to get will settle relatively fast. So I'll stir it up, and then just a second later, I will pour it into a second container. That way I'm getting only the finest bits. So I've, got, I've gotten a lot of that out. I'm just going to stir it up. As you can see, it just, there's still a lot of shale in there. But I've got, you can see the red suspended in there. That's what's going to make good paint right there. And I'm just going to pour off the finer particles. And now I'm going to get some more water in it so that I can stir it up and do it again. It's got a really nice red color. It seems to be the right shade of red for what I'm looking for, uh, for Salado Polychrome. And now I'm going to get some more water. And then once my container I'm pouring into is full, I have to wait for this to settle. And it won't take long. You'll see clear water uh, forming at the top. And then I will pour off that clear water and then pour into it some more. And I'll keep mixing and pouring as I get all the fine particles out of here. It'll stop producing good paint-like material. And then I'll just throw this out, let this settle, and it'll be ready to use. Okay, now I have to let this settle uh, for a while, so I'll come back in another half hour or so and we'll see how it's doing. This has settled some, and you can see it's not perfectly clear. It's, it's murky, but um, there is definitely water at the top that I can pour off. And if you pour really slowly, you'll see when it gets to the solid material. My container's getting full. Always leave enough room in your container that you can put your hand in there and mix it up, too. And there, now I'm starting to see the settled ochre. You know, and that's not a lot of paint, honestly, but it doesn't take much either. A little bit goes a long way. Um, but the way this works, uh, when you go to apply it, this is the material from the San Pedro that I was talking about. And all I do is just put it in water, mix it up with a brush and paint it right on the pot. I did that in a recent video. I'll put the link up here if you wanna see how I apply it. Uh, but that's it's really simple. You just basically just brush it on uh, And so then I'm going to continue to levigate this and then I'll just let it dry and settle and I'll just store it in a Ziploc bag or something like that uh, Now I haven't mentioned the name of the ruin I visited or the location specifically and the reason for that is because uh, these ruins get destroyed by people uh, people go up there and, and um, tear them apart or, or dig around looking for artifacts and um I know, you know, most of you are, are good people that wouldn't do that, but I just don't want to put it out there so that other people, bad people, people that are interested in, you know, collecting artifacts or other th damaging things to the ruins, uh, you know, we'll have a chance to do that. I'm going to show you a picture here of what the ruins looked like in, I think it was 1917. Uh, and you can see uh, they have sadly disintegrated in, you know, the 100 years or so since this picture was taken. Yeah. Some of that is probably natural disintegration. I mean, these ruins are 700 years old, but uh, some of it, no doubt, is people. People that are just looking to tear things up or hoping to find some treasure or something. So uh, that's what happens, unfortunately. If you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up so I know you liked it and I can make more videos of this sort. If you're enjoying this channel, think about subscribing so you know when the next video comes out. If you'd like to learn more about finding ochre and using it for pottery paint, check out this video over here, which will go into detail on finding ochre in a different spot here in the Southwest. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.